Polling's got a pretty bad rap, um, and largely, yeah, thank you. Um, largely, I think because um, politicians and other people don't really understand what polling actually is, which is this feedback loop with the electorate. Um, and polling should never tell you what to do, but it should challenge you to question whether what you think is happening is actually reflected in the public's mind. Um, the best things I get out of political research is when one of my ideas is wrong, not when they're right. So um, often you will um, go into the field with a great idea of a campaign or a way of shifting the public debate and then you see how it bounces off the electorate and it's a really humbling experience but it's also a great way of questioning your own self-certainty I guess and creating doubt because I think out of doubt comes the best strategy. So in a way that intro is by way of setting up what I want to talk about in terms of answering the question what does the Australian public want because it seems to me that the consensus has become that we're holding back this populist horde and off the back of Brexit and Trump and what's happening in Europe I liken it to for those that like the old movies the um, the characters in On the Beach sitting in Melbourne waiting for the nuclear cloud to come down and populism to seep seep into Australia. So when we um, see Pauline Hanson fluke a few extra seats because Malcolm Turnbull calls a double dissolution to save the furniture, we go, oh, populism's on the way. Um, when um, Scott Morrison starts bashing the banks, we go, oh, populism, yeah, that's populism. Or when um, Bill Shorten sort of pushes the, um, the racy card a little bit hard, we go, oh, that's populism. But I, looking at the polling numbers, I've got it's challenged me to come up with a slightly different thesis that I want to go through with you tonight and maybe bounce off and see if it gets us anywhere interesting. Um, I've got a few, um, I, I find what's quite useful in polling is to show a few tables because, um, although it doesn't seem to have come up, has it? Oh, that should actually be a table in there, but I can tell you what would have been in there if it had worked properly. Um, <laughs> polling is science meets art. You get a bunch of numbers, and then you try to make sense out of it. And if nobody has a better theory than yours, then you sort of stick with it till the next poll comes out. What we've seen since the last federal election is the coalition vote fall, Labor's vote go up two or 3%, but the One Nation votes actually drop back a couple of percent. Like Pauline Hanson's vote is in decline, it's not on the up. At the same time as the Palmer United Party's basically disappeared, and there's still a lot of noise about the right-wing populist parties, but I actually am building a bit of a theory that goes a bit more like this. So let's start with defining what populism is, which is um, simple slogans, three word slogans, simple solutions, divisive rhetoric, trying to turn one person against the other. And I can't help thinking that we've kind of already been through that, you know, stop the boats, axe the tax, ditch the witch seems to me that we, rather than waiting for populism to hit our shores, we might have already had our populist moment and it was Tony Abbott. And what he did over those couple of years, which broke a progressive government in Australia, um, with a little bit of help from that progressive government, I might add, um, really meant that we had a populist leader taking power in 2013. And then very quickly, um, displayed the shortcomings of a populist political agenda because you don't cut the debt with three words. You cut the debt by either raising taxes or cutting benefits to the people that you've been appealing to. And you know, Donald Trump's about to find this out as well. Um, so power, you know, populism's really easy in opposition. It's really, really hard when you're in, when you're in power. So. I'm re-looking at where Australian politics is now, not from the perspective that populism is coming, but we're almost in the reformation phase now, that we, we have had a populist government, it failed spectacularly, kind of makes Mike, Malcolm Turnbull the sort of Mike Pence of Australian politics. He's trying, <laughs> he's trying to clean up the mess, but he's, um, but he's um, condemned by his own collusion in the original project, and I think that's really where Turnbull's ended up. Um, 
I've got another theory about Turnbull, which is that he's actually never changed his view. He was always a barrister and he's just argued his case and it's just that the briefs changed, but that's, a, that's another theory. Um, so hopefully some of these slides will work. One of the things that backs up my theory is that we regularly ask a question on do you believe climate change is real, basically, and it's been asking it since back in 2009. At the moment, um, belief in climate science at 60% is at its highest level since before the whole thing went to pot under Rudd. Um, so that, that sort of implies the electorate's gone beyond um, the simple solution that we can't change. Um, it also reinforces the failure of the coal club to monster the renewable energy industry. Like they went out all guns blazing when there were the South Australian blackouts and it didn't really hit home. So those populist messages didn't really hit home. Um, I'll give you another one. Um, you want to click it along again? In this week's report, I thought I'll test this a little bit further and ask you know, a bunch of questions that sort of go to a bit more of the complexity of running a country. And yes, we're throwing positive messages at the electorate to see if they stick rather than negative messages. But again, I reckon it's kind of interesting. On the top level, I wish our leaders would look for more common solutions rather than just fighting each other, obviously. Sick of slogans from politicians. I want real answers on how government can operate better. And kind of, you'd expect those to have, yeah, people nod their head, but then, um, we don't want an isolationist government. Our government needs to find ways of working with the rest of the world and not turning our backs on the world. Um, also agreeing it's harder than ever for governments to control the influence of multinational corporations. Um, and then I thought that's a really interesting one. People have unrealistic expectations of the government's ability to sort everything out. Um, one of my earliest jobs was um, with Michael Costa, who was a bit of an enfant terribly of the um, New South Wales Union movement who ended up treasurer, who always claimed that his ambition in life was to write a book when he retired, which was, I'm fat, ugly and stupid, what's the government going to do about it? it? Sort of reinforces that one. Um, but then we come down to the final point, which says there's still a little bit of work to do for our you know, high-minded um, view of politics, which is most politicians are motivated by good intentions rather than self-interest. The public are yet to be convinced on that. Um, but those statements, which I put out today as part of my thesis that we've already had our pop this moment, says to me that um, at least when you throw positive frames about the way politics should operate, people are receptive to it. I guess the big question is when people ask what do people want is what do you do with that? Um, when you poll people on the most important issues, it's kind of predictable. Health, education, housing affordability is rising as an issue as well. And again, they're really easy to turn into um, slogans. I think, you know, let's be honest, what Labor did with Medicare at the last federal election, that was kind of populist messages. That wasn't really hardcore policy. But it seems to me, particularly from viewing some of our focus groups, that there are three really burning issues at the moment that all go to a degree to security. One is what I'd call energy security, which is a bit about power prices. It's a bit about a recognition that the, um, the, the energy industry is going to transition. And it's a bit of a sense that Australia is getting left behind by the rest of the world. Now, the manifestation of that is increased power prices called, caused by the gold plating of our national energy markets and the, the sell-offs of, um, of the public assets to big global corporations and foreign governments, which have been designed to deliver long-term profit streams, even as technology is making large-scale networks less and less um, a necessary part of our energy network. But that energy security piece requires complex government solutions that are not about socialising industries anymore, but about governments placing regulations that put the interests of consumers alongside the interests of corporations. The second issue that's going through really strongly, um, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, is what's called housing affordability, although I really hate the term. Um, housing affordability implies that the whole purpose is for people to buy homes, and it almost turns it into an economic debate rather than a debate about housing security, which is how are we going to provide housing for 
people to live close to their work? How do we provide pathways so that people can build security by investing in the market? How do we put the needs of buyers ahead of the interests of investors and particularly foreign investors? Again, complex set of policy um, answers required. Slogan's not good enough. Um, and you know, to their credit, I think Labor got some real chops at the last federal election by going out on their negative gearing and capital gains tax policy. It doesn't go far enough. There's a whole bunch of other, um, you know, really interesting policy debates around that sort of mix of community housing, social housing, um, shared equity that um, a, a government with a mandate to do interesting work can, can put onto the, um, onto the table. Um, and the third area that is just bubbling away like Betsy is job insecurity. Um, the number of people, I think I've got a slide on that. Do you want to flick through and see? The job insecurity one's huge. Maybe I don't. Maybe the slide's just exploded, has it? No? Climate action, that's going back a bit. Go forward, one more. Job, 30% um, expect in their next two years their job to be less secure than it is right now. You know, we've, we've, we've lived in a society where our whole, you know, I guess, our economic stability for many, many generations has been built on home ownership and secure jobs. Can't afford homes anymore unless you're inheriting or you're investing. Um, and there are fewer and fewer jobs that fit the, 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 the model of secure. Um, there, obviously, you guys know there's a number of drivers for that. Labor market deregulation, the, um, the shift from big corporations to outsourcing and contracting out. And the, the next wave, which is you know, we're in the middle of around automation of jobs as well. So what the, imp and, 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 and when you frame this as what is p are people looking for, um, I don't even think they know what the answer is and I don't think that it's promising necessarily um, that there's going to be lifelong jobs because they don't want that anymore, but there needs again to be pathways to security built into employment contracts. and. The role that government can play in um, particularly using their purchasing power when they're, when they're engaging corporations to do all the work that governments used to do internally as good public sector employers, except it was cheaper to contract it out, using that purchasing power to drive behaviours that both create um, skills pathways, particularly for apprentices, but also um, mandate um, transitions from contract to full-time employment are, are really um, potentially rife areas of, um, of, of policy exploration. So I think those three I see as being really um, engaging debates over the next 18 months in the lead up to the election. I'm, I'm sort of talking about the sort of things Labor wants to be talking about. Um, energy security, housing security, job security. The overlay of that is the inequality which is expressing itself in a really real way at the moment, which is the flat lining of real wage growth, which is really a proof that all those policies to stifle the rights of unions to organise and to, to, to weaken the Fair Work Commission are actually delivering what they need for business. So you've got your, your flat lining wages, you've got your corporate tax evasion, which is now an industry. I thought one of the really interesting things that Bill Shorten put in the um, budget in reply were measures to take away the tax deductibility of tax lawyers to give you advice to reduce tax, which I thought was kind of neat, but the numbers of high income individuals who are paying very little tax and also claiming over a million bucks on their tax um, accountants was kind of just ridiculous. And then the third element of that, of course, is that they're, um, they're opposing the corporate tax cut, which again, on one level, yeah, that's a populist you know, we don't want to give $65 billion to the corporate sector, but it's also a choice. And again, if that was all that Labor was going to do, was run the corporate tax um, argument, I'd be saying that's kind of just going down the populist path, but I think they're doing a little bit better than that at the moment. Um, so what do people want? I think they want issues like housing, energy and job security to be addressed. They want a sense of reciprocity that there's a shared buy-in into the economy and not the sense that if you're wealthy or you're part of a big foreign corporation, you don't have to pay your tax and you don't have to be part of the, um, the, the, the national set of obligations. And then I think the other thing that I, you know, 
I, I think people want is a sense that government represents them. And it, I think too often Labor goes to elections trying to prove they're better at policy than their opponents. Um, that they're, they're going to bring interest rates down more, or they've got a better economic plan. The reality is that Labor wins when um, the debate is framed up about around who is on your side rather than and whose interests are going to be represented by the government. So a lot of the advice I give to Labor parties in federally and at state levels is get things into a representational frame, which leads me to the one trick I've learnt in polling, which it might be the last slide. No, the company tax cuts, the reframe. So have anyone heard of the finger hut effect? It's, it's, the only, it's the only thing I've got really. So Vic Fingerhut is this old Washington pollster who's been doing um, politics in the States since the 60s. His first campaign was Hubert Humphrey. And he came up with this theory back in the 70s, um, which says this, it doesn't matter whether you're a good economic manager, a bad economic manager, or indifferent, if you ask people who's better at managing an economy, um, right of centre parties win 60-40 regardless of the economic conditions, regardless of what's going on. Um, happens in America, happens in Australia, happens in Britain, happens in Canada, happens in Germany. If you ask the same group of people, who's better at managing the economy in your interest, it shifts 55-45 on the side of progressive or left of centre parties. And that's not just about the language you use, that's about the way you frame things up. The recent successful campaigns, Work Choices was actually about the way the economy was working for people. So with an election 18 months away, I, I think we're in a position where we don't need to necessarily submit to the, the group think that <coughs> the only way Labor can win is to go to our baser instincts, that the only way to win is to, um, you know, put up walls against foreign workers and play Me Too on border protection and don't get too involved in climate change and you know, just bash the corporates. I think, I think Labor's, Labor can win doing a little bit better than that. And I think the thing is that if they do win doing a little bit better than that, it sets you up for a much more successful time in power if they can get there in 18 months time. A time when you want government actually to be doing significant things to rein in the power of the corporates um, and the wealthy in energy, in housing, and in the workplace so that you know the economy starts working for everyone again and there is the money then to reinvest also in the health and education. So that's my little sermon. I'm happy to take questions or, or jump to Ben. Okay, we'll, we'll, um, we'll do questions in a group afterwards. Okay. Is that good? Is that about yes, the right amount of time? Perfect timing. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you very much.